If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Well, Holly, let's go to the Ivy Organics uh, 3 in 1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Paige Embry is an author with a passion for gardening, living in Seattle, Washington. She's taught classes on geology, soils, gardening, and pruning. She's very knowledgeable on bees and bee science. Welcome to the program, Paige. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join Holly and myself and not over, not, not only educate us, but educate our listeners as well. Oh, you're welcome. So let's start with a simple question here, and, and, and it may be elementary level for Holly and me, but there are people that are out there that are listening that may not understand why bees are so important to us humans. Can, we, can, we, can you kind of go over the, 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 the short answer on why are bees so important and, and why should we be concerned with when we hear about hive die-off and, and loss of bee population? Well, there are the, the main thing that they do for us is that they pollinate plants, and there are oh probably around two hundred thousand different kinds of animals that pollinate plants. But the queens are the bees of pollination because female bees actually most female bees actually go to a plant to collect pollen, so they're they're going to um, always come into contact with it. Whereas a lot of other Animals and insects just go to get the, the nectar, and they may or may not come into contact with it. So they are primo pollinators. And I, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but, like, one bee has to travel thou- hundreds of thousands of miles or something to, in order to create one pound of honey or so, some astronomical number in the number of flowers they have to um, be in contact with? You know, I don't know the number for how far they have to travel. Honeybees can travel um, more than a mile if they need to to go to flowers, but, of course, they like it better when there's flowers close to home. But honeybees are only one kind of bee, and there's 20,000 different species in the world. And so some of them are really small, and they don't travel very far, and they don't make honey. So it, it, it's going to vary from bee to bee. Uh, you're right, and and are are all bees pollinators? You said not all of them make honey, but do all of them pollinate, or are there different categories in which bees fall under? Some ca- uh, pollinators, some not. No, all bees are pollinators. Some are going to be better pollinators than others are. Um, there is the male bees don't actually collect pollen. It's only the female bees that um, collect pollen because they use it to feed their babies, and so. Female bees tend to be better than other bees. And, and in that group, there's going to be some that are more efficient than others. So some bees are better pollinators, but all bees are going to flowers to collect nectar and so just to eat themselves. And so that makes them pollinators. What, what is the general life cycle of a bee? Uh, how, how many years or months do it, does a typical bee live? Um, so most bees are not like honeybees. Uh, they don't live in hives. They don't have a bunch that are living and working together. Most are solitary bees. So for most bees, what happens is the mother lays an egg in a hole somewhere, either below ground or above ground, and the egg goes through, it, it, it turns into a larva, so it looks like a little grub, um, and then it pupates, and then it becomes an adult. So it goes through complete metamorphosis, sort of like what you think of for a butterfly. But most of their life is lived in that little hole somewhere. Um, and then they come out usually about a year after they're laid. This isn't for honeybees. It's for most of the other bees. About a year after they're laid. And then they live for about a month or so, most of them, as adults out flying around and pollinating. So their time pollinating is actually short a short period of time. Now, you say not all bees live in hives. So what other homes do bees find in order to can carry on their lives? Well, most bees live in in the ground. About 70% of the bee species live in the ground, and they a lot of them will dig their own little holes. So they have a lot of times you'll see just like a flat hole in the ground, or it might look like a little ant hole. Um, some bees also live in uh, pre-made holes above ground, so like old beetle burrows and and deadwood and things like that. So that will account for a lot of the bees. And then there's there are some social other social bees like bumblebees where you've got a bunch of bees living together, so they need a bigger hole. So like bumblebees often find uh, 
pre-existing holes in the ground like old rodent holes and make their nest there. Okay. Now, we hear about neonicotoids and bee deaths. Um, first of all, what are neonicotoids and what is the correlation? So neonicotinoids is a kind of insecticide. And so the purpose of insecticides is to kill insects. And bees are insects, as are a lot of the things that we don't like on our plants um, that may come along and sort of eat the leaves and things like that. And so the thing about, I'm just going to call them neonics because it's quicker and easier. The thing about them that makes them sort of special is that the a lot of pesticides get sprayed on the outside of a plant, but for neonics, they get taken up by the roots and transported throughout the plant so you can find the pesticide everywhere in the plant and there's not, you don't have to use very much of it. So that makes them sort of special as a pesticide and they're often used as a treatment around seeds and so the seed just comes to you with the pesticide available to it. Well, and that's the other thing. We encourage people and people think dandelions are the evil of all evils in a yard We encourage people not to spray the dandelions because nature has designed a dandelion to be one of the first uh, pollinatable flowers in the spring. So we spray it with a toxicity uh, that has nicanoids in it, and then the bee takes it back and basically infests the whole colony with that toxin. Well, there has been a study that, you know, looked at um, honey around the world for honeybees and found that... um, Neonics and actually probably a number of other insecticides have been found in that honey, so we do know that it is getting back to the honey, and it is trans- when it's transported throughout the plant, it does end up in the uh, nectar and the pollen. And one of the things most people don't realize is that you can do a study on honeybees and find one thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true for all of those other 20,000 species of bees out there. So even if you find something is maybe not that bad for honeybees, it may be better or worse for some of those other bees, and, and mostly there's not going to be studies done on those other bees. So the safest thing is always to not use insecticides and definitely not to do something like with the, the neonics where – you're just assuming there's going to be a problem because you're putting that pesticide on the seed. And so you're treating for a problem that doesn't even necessarily, might not even come to exist. Exactly. Now, we'll talk about honeybees because most people are familiar with that species. Are honeybees native to North America or were they brought in by a, a, a culture of people? Well, they are not native to North America. They came in to North America with the early colonists because they brought them over not as pollinators but for their honey and their beeswax. Bobby. That's definitely interesting. Um, what can we do as backyard gardeners or even um, maybe we just want to plant a few things? What, what can we do to increase bee population? Uh, so one of the things you can do is, again, there are lots of different kinds of bees that come out at different kinds of the year. So it good to have flowers throughout the year starting early because some of those bumblebee queens wake up early and they're starving after sleeping through the winter. And so having some really early blooming plants wherever you are can be helpful. Crocuses, for example, are are a nice um, pollinator plant. And to make sure that you've got, it's a lot easier for bees if you plant in big clumps of one kind of flower. Because they're, they're, they, they focus on that color? Uh, is that what attracts them to that colony of flowers? Is that what we're uh, recommending to plant in groups? Uh, I'm recommending to plant in groups because bees have to learn how to get the pollen and nectar out of a flower, especially some of the complicated flowers like snapdragons and things like that. Um, and so once they learn, it's easier for them to just collect from the same kind of flower and, it, and if they're long-blooming flowers, that's even better because then they can go back to that same patch day after day after day, and they know how to get the food. It's like going to a grocery store where you know, you know, that's familiar to you. You know where to go, and it's a, lot, a much more quick and efficient for you. 
Well, uh, we, we talk about the honeybee, and also in the garden community, we hear the term carpenter bee. What is a carpenter bee uh, for those of us who may not be familiar with or that like term? like a mason bee. A mason bee, bee yeah. Uh, a mason bee is a group of bees that's a solitary bee. So each, each bee lives their entire life alone. Nobody help, helps it collect pollen and nectar for its, for its babes. Um, and it lives in an abundance. Most of them live in above-ground holes, and you can actually put out, like, blocks of wood that have been drilled, and they will often make holes in it. But one of the things that makes them cool is that many of them are early spring bees, and so they're really, and they are really efficient at pollinating, like, apples and cherries and things like that. But they need mud because between each egg, they put up a little mud wall, a little mud wall and that's why they're called basin bees because they, they use mud. To make their homes. Okay. Now, you've got a new book out all about bees. Tell us a little bit about the book and where can we get it? Uh, the book is called Our Native Bees, North America's Endangered Pollinators and the Fight to Save Them, and it can be gotten at bookstores or online. It seems to be readily available in a lot of places. And in the book, it's not a how to garden for bees uh, kind of book, although there's a fair amount of that kind of thing in there. It was, I learned that honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes, and it got me fascinated with all of the other bees that can pollinate tomatoes. And so I went and gathered up stories about bees and put them, put them together in a book along with a lot of pictures because a lot of bees look nothing like honeybees, and they're really cool. So there's a lot of photos in the book as well. So, so it's kind of, is it, would it be able to identify certain species of bees that we may not be familiar with? Does it have that kind of uh, availability to it? You know, identifying new kinds of bees is hard. So there's lots of photos, so it's helpful. But the purpose is not to sort of teach you how to um, identify new bees. A great book for that kind of thing it's not one you would just sit down and read in your armchair, which is what my book is, but a book if you want to learn, like, start to learn how to identify bees. A great one is called Bees in Your Backyard. Okay. Well, I greatly appreciate the, the time that you've given us uh, on the program. Uh, again, your book is probably available, what, on Amazon as well? Absolutely. Okay. And um, do you have a website or anything like that? I do. My website is just my name, www.pageembry.com, and you can find uh, links on there and some blog posts. So you can go there and get to the book or see some of the other um, interviews and things like that I've done as well. Well, Paige, we greatly appreciate you taking time not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners, too. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you for checking out the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. For more, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for full and in studio video and podcast replay of season one. Season two underway and added weekly. Tweet us at TWVG show or hashtag TWVG to be part of the program.